an awful lot of different names, but it's the same, same horrific ideology as, as this one. And we're just probably lucky that we don't have to pick up uh, old rifles to fight it in our age yet. But um, yeah, I wrote this book six years ago now, and I've written three books since. My only advertising plug tonight is my new book that came out uh, a month ago, and it's a lovely Christmas present, and it's a mix of photography and stories. There's a lot of social and, and radical history in it. I went around Scotland with uh, a photographer friend. This is called This is Scotland, and that's my only advertising piece. Um, not particularly to make much money from it, we just wanted to document the last, last six months before the referendum, and we don't even mention the referendum once. We thought it'd be nice to capture everyday Scotland, talk a lot about radical politics. Um, I don't just mention that as an advertisement, but because there are elements in this that I imagine some people here would enjoy. But that's to illustrate, in between that, I wrote two books about football and travel and social history as well. One on Scotland, one on England. And so I've sort of forgotten a lot of this, so I've gone back to the, the script and I noticed the last time I talked to an audience about this was the Rotary Club, which I was amazed to be invited to, and perhaps you have some different, different politics to the Rotary Club, and perhaps I do, but it was an interesting occasion, I can assure you. So I'll talk for around half an hour and tell the stories of those people that fought, also nursed and fundraised, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk after. Between 1936 and 1939, some 549 Scots served in the Spanish Civil War. Around a quarter of them are still in Spain, sleeping under the soil they volunteered to fend from fascism. Seventy years have passed since the end of the conflict they gave their lives to. They were fascist warfare's early victims, felled by the same Luftwaffe in Spain that would later wreak havoc across Europe. In Spanish fields, foreign politics were played out as ordinary Scots became the victims of manoeuvrings plotted in London, Berlin and Moscow. Barbaric and visceral, this rehearsal for World War II left half a million dead and established General Franco's dictatorship. The Spanish Republic Scots had fought for was emphatically quashed. Demonstrating a prescience lacking from the British governments of the 1930s, Scots had illegally journeyed to Spain to quell the threat of pan-European combat. They went to as an extension of domestically waged campaigns against unemployment, poverty and British fascism. The cause of the Spanish Republic came to embody every struggle the Scottish working class was embroiled in. On Spanish shores went logic steeped in the progressive tradition they could build a better, Fascism-free tomorrow to be exported home. Scotland can be proud of them. In Spain's war, the Scottish people found a cause that struck a chord with them like no other had, or perhaps has, since. What happened in Spain, and in support of Spain, has to be seen in the context of 1930s Scotland. It was there and then that domestic and foreign struggles became connected. The 1930s in Scotland were a time of intense activity and idealism. Political fires burned and crackled unremittingly. On corners, men and women gathered to listen to the airs of John McLean spouting socialism and anti-fascism, their incendiary words firing working-class solidarity. They became inspired to fight fascism in its every form and wherever it cropped up. All of this has to be viewed in the wider context of just how radical this Scotland was. It was a country of communist councillors and members of parliament and seemingly endless waves of strike action, protest marches and demonstrations. Members of these movements nailed their colours to the mast of the Spanish Republic from the moment war broke out in Spain in July 1936. Their Scotland was one of entrenched hardship. The plague of mass unemployment engulfed the land. Poverty and infant mortality rates were among the worst in Europe and beyond. Yet instead of turning to the reactionary politics of scapegoating by looking to the British Union of Fascist Francis, Scottish poverty bred the radical politics of socialist hope and faith in united actions to win a better tomorrow. They created a national unemployed workers movement to give voice to the anxieties and ire of the redundant and impoverished masses. That NUWM instigated a num number of hunger marches down to London, and many of those who partook in these went on to fight in Spain. As Scottish NUWM leader Harry McShane suggested, many of the marchers understood the significance of the war, and some expressed the desire to fight in Spain for the Republic. There was a clear conjoining of issues. Spain 
was another prong of the struggle. This support for the Spanish Republic was underpinned by an opposition to fascism that appears to have come naturally to Scotland. It was a deep-seated and innate antipathy to fascism, whether in Scotland or further afield. If, ran the consensus, fascism was not defeated in Spain, it would soon have to be defeated on an unknown and unparalleled scale at home instead. Bombs on Madrid today means bombs on Scotland tomorrow became a common slogan. Many of those Scots who became embroiled in anti-fascist action on the streets of Scotland would later fight in Spain. It was almost as if it didn't matter where fascism cropped up, whether in the Calton fighting the British Union of Fascists or in Catalonia taking on Franco, Hitler, Mussolini. In Aberdeen, a key city in the Scottish anti-fascist movement due to the local presence of William Chambers Hunter, Oswald Mosley's representative in Scotland, many men who would later fight in Spain took part in street skirmishes with British fascists. One of them was Bob Cooney, who later explained, I thought we had to smash them off the street. When the BUF arrived, we'd shout, these are the black-shirted bastards who are murdering kiddies in Spain, spit on them, kids. Sometimes we'd be too late because the women had already dealt with them. Bill Cranston, an unemployed chimney sweep from Leith, recalled being involved in numerous street scrapes with fascists, drawing direct parallels between the struggles in Scotland and those in Spain. Something I didn't like at all were the black shirts, the British fascists led by Mosley. Before we volunteered to go to Spain to help the Spanish Republic defend itself against Franco, we used to read a lot about the treatment that the Jews were getting in London at the hands of Mosley's fascists. Opposition to fascism did not always take the form of organised political demonstration or counter-demonstration. For Steve Fullerton, challenging fascism was a personal reaction rooted in his sense of humanity. This was central in persuading him to take up in Spain the fight he had waged in his native Shettleston. Steve said to me, fascism was a terrible thing, what it was doing to everybody, trade unionists and politicians who weren't Nazis, things like that. And of course, it was the bombing. The bombing of civilians that really got on my nerves. I'd go to the cinema and see that on the newsreel. See the women running with the bairns in their hands, eyes turned skywards for the planes to see if they were coming. That was absolutely disgraceful in the 20th century. But it happened. I know it happened. And eventually, that's what drove me to offering to join the international brigades. It was a straightforward thing to say I'd like to join them. All I could do was offer my services and hope it would be worthwhile. Whether motivated by political conviction or a heartfelt sense of right and wrong, Scots were resolutely moved to fight fascism at home and willing to export that fight abroad. This was underpinned by the notion that if it were not laid to rest in Spain, fascism would come to Britain in the shape of the Second World War and invasion. Whatever the disparate motivations for going to Spain, Scottish volunteers were overwhelmingly united by their social background. John Dunlop said of his compatriot brigaders, I only knew one middle class type, and that was me. Those that fought mainly came from a range of working class jobs. There were coal miners, painters, printers, engineers, builders, and even a lemonade salesman. There were too a considerable number of unemployed labourers in Spain, and a small cluster of middle class students, obviously unknown to them. Scots came to be in Spain because they made the cause of the Spanish Republic a further facet of their own domestic struggles, namely those against fascism and for the emancipation of the working class. Having decided to take the plunge and set out for Spain, volunteers for the cause faced a perilous journey. Many had never left Britain before. Many had never even left Perth, Dundee, Glasgow or Aberdeen before. Their journey was to an illegal one, as Britain had signed a non-intervention treaty and invoked a Victorian law to stop Brits participating in Spain anymore. If caught in Britain, France or Spain, the volunteers risked lengthy prison sentences for the crime of opposing fascism, just as the British state was appeasing it. In a buoyant atmosphere, Scots were channeled through Glasgow and bussed on train to London. Glasgow volunteer Jimmy Maley recalled the sense of adventure boarding the bus engendered. It was like a Celtic supporters outing. I recognised some of them who'd gone to school with me. From London, they purchased weekend rail and ferry tickets to Paris, the best way to get around the fact that so few of them were wealthy enough to possess passports. In Paris, the men were put up in safe houses till it was time for them to catch a further train to the Pyrenees and then make their way on foot over that range of mountains and into Spain. 
Silently, they made their way through the night, tripping over branches, rocks, and each other. Despite moments more at home in Dad's army, they made it. Their commitment would not be stunted by a mere broken arm or leg. Volunteer John Dunlop beautifully described the mood among the many nationalities of volunteers partaking the journey. Exhilaration frothed in our veins. We laughed at the laws and international agreements made to forbid us in our mission, at the venal politicians who had made them, and at the police and military who were charged with the duty of preventing us. A feeling of triumph seemed to trumpet all over us. In these testing, if defiant times, a sense of comradeship was built between the many nationalities taking part in the arduous trek. Dunlop recalled the moment his own party arrived and were treated to coffee in a sing-song at the foot of the Spanish Pyrenees. The singing started. Such singing as I had never heard the like of, each nation singing its own worker song of protest till the building became filled with a volume of sound that gradually swelled into one glorious chorale, the international. Sung together in a dozen different tongues, words cannot express the exaltation that surged in our hearts. This was the greatest moment of our lives. This exhilaration was to be short-lived as the brutality of war and the weaknesses of the Republican army they had volunteered to fight in became clear. On arrival, Scottish volunteers were given six weeks of military training. Brigadier George Murray summed up what most felt about this training when he called it more or less useless. Such was the shortage of weaponry until sustained Soviet help arrived. All drills were on a purely theoretical basis and Steve Fullerton recalled completing shooting practice with broom handles for guns. In spite of this, the men were rapidly sent into battle. They were often to pay the ultimate price for this lack of preparation. In January 1937, the newly formed British battalion containing over 100 Scots was dispatched to the Lama Valley, southeast of Madrid, despite a lack of preparation and weaponry. Their mission was to defend the Madrid to Valencia road as the nationalists advanced upon the capital. The ill-equipped battalion suffered immediate and considerable losses, and their entire machine gun company, including 15 Scots, was captured and arrested by nationalist forces. It slowly they were grouped, and against all the odds began to hold their own hand when reinforcements came, pushed back the nationalist advance. Inevitably, it came at a price. Well over a quarter of the 500 British battalion men who had gone into battle were killed, and a comparable number invalided home. The number of Scots in each group was high. Those wounded became so in the most agonising circumstances. Tom Clark, a Dundonian stretcher bearer, was shot in the head in an area so delicate that doctors refused to remove the bullet. Instead, and without anaesthetic, a dentist extracted the shell. Thomas Brannan, a bricklayer from Blantyre who had taken part in the hunger marches to London, was shot in the head and killed while carrying the stretcher of a Scottish comrade. At the time, his wife stoically wrote, I am more than proud in my grief of my hero in the way that he is dead. He did not need anyone to urge him to go to Spain. It has been in him all along to go out and fight for the great cause of his comrades. I will always be very proud of him. Around 35 Scottish brigades died during the main days of fighting at Verana. I'll have a water and not a Volunteer Bill Gilmore wrote home at the time. My heart throbs at the sight of those graves. And as the memory of those boys comes back to me, with all their gestures, jokes and good humour, their political understanding between one another, I can't help but shed a silent tear. Often I think of them when alone in my dugout or on guard at night by my machine gun. If Britain only knew what they owed those dead heroes, they would give them as much room in their sentiments as they give to the unknown soldiers of the Great War. However, that the British battalion were able to achieve even a stalemate after the debilitating early losses they suffered was a breathtaking accomplishment born of the bravery and sheer resilience they had to offer. <coughs> Holding back the nationalists at Harama created a sense of optimism, one that compelled the British to believe they were ready to take part in their first offensive rather than defensive action. So it was that in the summer of 1937, the battalion prepared itself for an assault on Brunetti west of Madrid, with the aim of encircling nationalist troops in that area. Their assault was an unmitigated disaster. Of 331 men present on the first day of battle, 
289 were killed or wounded or captured by the last. The battalion had been conclusively, brutally routed. In a letter home, shortly afterwards, Alec Donaldson from Coke Bridge commented on the devastation and despair Brunette wrought. I was considerably cut up after the Brunette events. The fact that our best comrades went down in that offensive upset me tremendously. Brunetti was a terrible battle and had all the characteristics of a really big one. It will certainly be dwarfed in some of the movements to come, but it has been the first engagement of a really World War character. This was a costly, morale-sapping defeat, and by the autumn of 1937, the British battalion was in dire need of reorganisation and reinforcements. That ultimate prize had been, prize had been emphatically paid. As well as the impact made by the men who fought in Spain, there was too the vital, valiant role played by the many selfless female nurses who travelled to serve. Perhaps most heroic among Scots nurses was Annie Murray. Of the three Murray siblings who served in Spain, Annie was the first to volunteer. She arrived there in late September 1936 and was to serve for almost the entire duration of the war. After living in Aberdeenshire and Perthshire, Annie led protests against working conditions while employed at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. It was perhaps unsurprising, therefore, that she chose to put a burgeoning nursing career on hold and volunteer for Spain for the British Medical Aid Committee. In her eyes, the decision to go to Spain was straightforward. I went to Spain because I believed in the cause of the Spanish Republican government. I didn't believe in fascism, and I had heard many stories of what happened to people who were under fascist rule. On the Aragon front, despite torrid conditions, Annie and the other nurses provided an outstanding level of commitment and care. No sacrifice was too great for Annie, and she regularly donated her own blood to patients, including two pints to her own brother George when he was shot and wounded. As you can imagine, she saw some pretty harrowing sights. In one letter, she wrote, We have had an extremely busy and rather a depressing time at the hospital here lately. We have been taking all kinds of cases, and I can tell you we've had many very tragic ones among them and many deaths. Many have been shot through the lungs and heads, many legs, arms, abdomen and other injuries. Few of the lung and head cases have recovered. We are certainly seeing war at its worst now. Many just bleed to death. I wish more of the people at home realised what war actually means. Then they might do more to try to prevent it. And they want the most inappropriate music goes to that final remark just hints at the incisive grasp of world events and political acumen that Annie possessed. She was not only caring, but deeply knowledgeable and perceptive, her political convictions heartfelt, but studied. Of all the horror Murray witnessed in Spain, it was an incident later in the conflict that was to seal her lifelong hatred of fascism and warfare. In November 1938, she was working in Port Boo, north of Barcelona, when an unusually large intake of child patients arrived in the hospital, all with disfiguring injuries to their hands and faces. Writing to her sister Agnes, Murray related how Italian aeroplanes had dropped. Pretty little cigarette boxes and chocolate boxes with hand bombs neatly packed inside. The poor little mites of children picking up what they took to be the long desired chocolate and quickly opening them were suddenly left handless. Their faces burned beyond recognition. Nothing could surely be more brutal. What a bloody awful war this has been. A conflict initially waged through field methods mirroring those of the Great War now featured civilian aerial attacks with all their intrinsic callous brutality. As Annie had witnessed, in Spain was modern warfare born. Despite all of this, and despite the Republic's eventual defeat, Annie never regretted her decision to serve, saying in the 1980s, it was the most important thing of my life. It was a terrific experience I would never like to have missed. I have certainly no regrets of having gone there at all. <coughs> While women like Annie Murray played a key role in Spain, so too did women take the lead in the Aid for Spain movements that sprang up back here in Scotland. Reaction to Spain's plight was immediate, instinctive, and characterised by a generosity above and beyond the call of duty and the reality of means available. A large proportion of aid for Spain work was carried out by working class women. They became impassioned supporters of Republican Spain, the volunteers of the Home Front. 
Initially, money and food were collected by individuals forming an unofficial humanitarian response that was to be gradually succeeded by more formal and sustained campaigns. Concerts, fiestas and film showings were staged to raise both funds and awareness, and flag days for Spain became a regular feature of Scottish life. Prams were commandeered for collecting food from door to door, tins rattled on street corners, and fundraising events meticulously, prolifically organised. As well as the above mentioned methods of raising awareness and money, there were unorthodox ones, such as a campaign to provide fish and chips for Spain, and one to create a mile of pennies in every town and village across Scotland. Then a youngster in Fife, Rab Smith recalled, We sold a cigarette called Smoke Clouds. We sold them in order to raise money to send to the Spanish Aid Fund. I'm sure they injured the health of the people that smoked them, because they had a terrible smell. Nevertheless, I wasn't concerned. I was concerned about saving Britain and saving the people in Spain. In Montrose, a centre for Basque refugee children was opened, and in Hoyk, a disused mill was occupied by unemployed people and turned into a workers' mill, churning out clothing for soldiers of the Republic. A food ship was organised and took a thousand tonnes of food to desperate publicans towards the end of the war. Whatever the period of struggle against Franco's nationalists, in villages, towns and cities, as individuals or in organisations, Scots and particularly Scots women built a solidarity movement of real consequence and clout. Much of their effort went to providing what improvements could be offered to those back over in Spain. Many of the concerns of the mainly first-time Scottish travellers were summed up by volunteer John Miller of Alexandria when he wrote up to a friend, This place isn't so bad, although it isn't quite as cheerful as Socky Hall Street on a Saturday evening. As a matter of fact, it isn't hellish cheerful at all. You can't drop into Lauders and have a quiet one and have a night at the playhouse. As to women, I haven't spoken to one yet. The brigade's hierarchy did its very best to make life as comfortable as possible. A welcome system of leave was implemented in entertainment by tell. Wall newspapers full of caricatures and sardonic poetry were run by each company and football matches a regular occurrence. Cultural committees were established that provided battalion members with gramophones, wireless radios, draft and chess sets, dominoes and a library. Lectures were given on various topics and schools for the education of illiterate Spanish comrades were formed with lessons given by British soldiers. Further interest was provided by the visits of public figures such as Clement Attlee and Pandit Nehru and, perhaps more memorably, Paul Robeson and Errol Flynn. One pleasure that many Scots brigaders sorely missed as well as a pint of heavy was a British cigarette. Alec Donaldson summed up their agony. The smokes problem is very acute. We sometimes get one packet per week of cigarettes which, are, which have only one claim to the name, the fact that they have the same shape as the genuine article. They are known as anti-tanks, but are twice as deadly. In terms of meals, brigaders were reasonably well fed when behind the lines, but in battle, it could be a different story. David Anderson of Aberdeen recalled in desperate hunger eating snakes and snails, while Edinburgh student David Mackenzie's diet consisted of three main staples, rice, beans and chickpeas, making tent-based night times a very interesting experience indeed. On the Aragon front, Tommy Bloomfield of Kirkcaldy became so hungry that he began to eat raw onions as if they were apples. Rested though, there were even enough resources for burn suppers and Christmas feasts, not to mention free-flowing local vino, which led, predictably, to a number of incidents. Steve Fullerton described to me the occasion on which his friend Jimmy Glavin from Govan was sent to collect supplies. At night time, before we went to the Ebro, we used to have a fire and sing song. They'd get a big jar of wine from the village, so somebody would have to go for it, and a bag of nuts. It came to Jimmy's turn to go into the village one night with somebody else. Jimmy and the other man off they went into the village. They took a long time to get back. We were getting anxious about them. Eventually, he came back, drunk as can be. Somebody got on to him. Where have you been? I've been in the village for wine and nuts. By this time, we'd picked up the jar. You've been drinking it? Well he said. It was heavy. <laughs> Scots, though, generally assimilated well into Spanish life. Many learned the language so proficiently that they could put local women off at ten paces. At every turn they were lauded. Possibly the only time in history a foreign army has been so welcome in another country's war. As Brigadier James Walk, a World War I veteran from Airdrie wrote, 
This is something different from the last war. We know what we're fighting for this time. The kiddies hold up their hands in the red front salute and greet us as we pass. I'm proud to be fighting for the Spanish people and for democracy. To those Spanish people, this bunch of miners, shoe repairmen and printers have become heroic saviours. Life in Spain needed comforts like Fino and welcomes like those offered by locals because back in battle, things continue to be difficult at best and horrific at worst. Having gathered themselves and welcomed new recruits following the calamity of Brunette, the British battalion had moved eastwards towards Aragon, the region sandwiched between Madrid and Catalonia. They immediately captured the important town of Quinto from the clutches of the nationalists. Heartened by this success, the Republicans moved on to Fuentes de Ebro, a town beside the strategically vital River Ebro, with the aim of seizing it, moving into the surrounding valley ahead of an advance in Zaragoza. It was an objective they fell catastrophically short of completing. Regardless of their calamitous experience at Fuentes, the British contingent of the Republican army pressed on to Belchite, emerging victorious from a traumatic rash of hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Nationalists. Hugh Sloan recalled the unique nature of combat at Belchite. Belchite was a particular kind of battle at close quarters. You were seeing the person you were killing. That's a different thing from killing people at a distance. In that respect, it was a very bitter battle. The British battalion did manage some successes in this period, for instance, playing a key part in capturing the town of Teruel. These gains escalated the feelings within the battalion that Republican success was now inevitable. Sadly, this optimism soon ebbed away as the British battalion were forced from the end of January into a series of retreats amidst a fierce nationalist onslaught. Franco's forces powered into Terrell and forced the Republicans to decamp some 70 miles over the following days, brutally taking back Belchite as they did so. They were eventually forced back to Calafete where, at the end of March, over 100 were ambushed and imprisoned. The battalion, now just 80 strong, retreated to Gandesa before the nationalists pushed them out and back over the river Ebro, where a retreat of 125 miles finally came to a halt. By the summer of 1938, Franco's army was advancing rapidly on Madrid. The response of the Republican High Command was to instigate an audacious raid southwards over the river Ebro and into nationalist territory. In late July, the British battalion were informed that they would be among an army of 80,000 Republicans undertaking this forward surge. It was, for once, a monumental success, as Scots and every other nationality that made up the international brigades streamed over the river and into enemy territory. A day after their safe passage over the Ebro, the battalion were back in offensive action. They became stymied by a determined nationalist defensive operation, and British casualties in particular quickly mounted during six days of intensive fighting in the mainland summer swelter of Spain. Though the British battalion were hopelessly equipped against the war machine of Hitler's Convoy Legion, there were a few honourable and fairly spectacular victories for them in this period, before finally their withdrawal from Spain was announced. After a gallant, dogged resistance, the Spanish-only Republican army was subsequently pushed back towards Madrid and their eventual defeat began to appear inevitable. On October 29, 1938, a parade was held in Barcelona in honour of the homebound international brigade with hundreds of thousands of Spaniards lying in the streets. Bill Cranston described the occasion. I really wanted to cry. We got a tremendous reception from the people of Barcelona. And it's a thing I'll never forget. Never. And so came home the soldiers of the International Brigades. On December 7th, 1938, the majority of the British battalion pulled into Victoria Station to be met by a crowd of 20,000 eager to welcome home the heroes. The brigade was then marched to Downing Street and took part in a number of protest events before the Scots finally departed for home and further rapturous welcomes in Glasgow, Edinburgh. There was a certain amount of regret among brigaders, as Thomas Quinn from New Mains told the Glasgow Herald journalist on the platform of Central Station. In one way, we're very glad to be home again and to see our friends here, but I think that all of us feel that we would like to have stayed on and to have fought the war to finish. The Spanish Civil War had a remarkable effect on Scotland and provided a great cause around which all the progressive movements of the 1930s could find their ideals embodied. 
Not only do we rightly commemorate it in statues, but also in our actions today by pledging to oppose whatever creed fascists are. Though expressing his pride at being part of the International Brigade, Steve Fullerton could have been referring to pro-Republican Scotland in its entirety when he movingly said, Here were a body of men who I don't think will ever be equaled in their intensity of purpose, trying to eliminate fascism. There are many people who set out on different jobs and they fall by the wayside, but not them. And that's been my pride, that I was one of them. That's something to be proud of.
they'd done a lot of things that annoyed the establishment as such, especially on women's rights and, and taking land from landowners and redistributing it to, to peasants and it very much annoyed this political class. They weren't particularly fascist, they were fascist in it, but Franco wasn't a fascist at that point. He hadn't really discovered anything as, as intelligent as ideology. He was an ex-soldier part of that cabal that just resented these very progressive measures that were, were taking place and, and all they could see fit to do to get rid of it was, was a, a military coup basically, with a, a plain borrow from Britain as far as I remember. Um, and on the, yeah, as you say, on the poop from, well, Scots were involved with the, has anyone seen London Freedom in the film? Because that concentrates very much on that split. And, and some Scots went and weren't part of the International Brigades. There's a, big, a couple of chapters in the book about, about um, that, whether they, they fought or not. And a couple um, were alongside Orwell and, and things. But the thing that came across amongst letters, as I say, the main resources and things was was that they were really annoyed more than anything about the infighting because it had taken the eye off the ball so much and of course a lot of them wanted to export this revolution home as part of the politics but they were annoyed about this infighting but especially retrospectively the brigaders that lived on into the 70s and 80s were annoyed that the Spanish Civil War was becoming ca um, characterised by these, this left infighting instead of the good things that happened and, 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 and the, the unity and um, I think that was interesting. It was interesting reading how much a lot of the surviving brigaders, brigaders that saw that film which hated London Freedom for, for what it portrayed um, really resented it. John Dunlop, I mentioned there, a 12 page review that I remember coming across and I thought, it's longer than the whole film, this review. But, um, so that, that hurt them a lot, I think, the portrayal of, of, of Spain in that way. I don't come down on either side in, in that book, it's uh, deep to know the answers to that. It's better on the fence there, it was an argument, maybe. I think it's better <laughs> to stay the fence and protect the past. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here, yeah, well, it's certainly, I think, we landed freedom, certainly, I'd be privileged to speak to some of the surviving brigaders. Um, and, yeah, I think we felt that it was part of trying to discredit them. Yeah. Uh, they'd been discredited at the time by the establishment, and then they found themselves rejudged, if you like. A, by history, by folk who, in their eyes, had not done a hands turn yeah. for the movement, you know, uh, and obviously that's it. One of the things, I've, that, that was my question, <laughs> one of the things I've always found a bit perplexing just about the whole Spanish war is that Franco's uh, troops were on back to Moors, and in fact he had North African forces mm -hmm. in the name, in the front line, fighting internationalists who were afraid for the three, and I just wonder, has anything ever been done about the colonial troops? And I'm kind of thinking about oh, it. I, I can't answer it, I would yeah, say so. My, my specialism is not to get here really, but it does, it does, yeah. Um, I think there's probably a little bit of slavery, a little bit of slavery in that, and other mm -hmm. things. And, you know, but, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess it has, because most areas of this have been done now. But I, I, I'll answer honestly instead of. Attending them on question time and talking for two minutes. Yes, I'm next book. Yeah, probably someone would pay me to go to sit down. Just and briefly, and anecdotally, uh, my granddad, George Deaver, was in Ibeer and then he was um, captured and then imprisoned. And he was, um, he was captured by Moors. She did find it particularly ironic because one of the, um, his co brigaders, who didn't live particularly well, had been in the British Army and had served in China and as, as they were being captured and didn't know what was going to happen to them, the guy became more and more nervous and said to George, I don't like this, I don't like this at all. And my granddad George had laughed and said, of course you don't like it. He said, but he, he said not long ago you were in China bullying the Chinese, he said, and now you're here being bullied by the Moors. So obviously there was some acknowledgement of this of agony of the situation. Yeah. And and Grandad George was the best story about him. About turning up, about the death. Yes. A number of stories, yes. He was he was <laughs> captured but he was declared missing, presumed dead, and so back back in Edinburgh it, um, there was obviously distress. There was a couple of memorial meetings in Leith, um, organised by the Communist Party, uh, another group, 
um, and subsequently the death certificate arrived, which was very important because my great grandmother, his mother, was able to claim half a crown in insurance, which was never paid back. He then returned in January. The you can year. get the insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> you can sometimes. And anyway, the famous story is that George has, you know, two death certificates. <laughs> he is in fact dead now. Turned up at home. It happened to hear them that. that they turned up at home. Yes, actually. Give the mother's a bit of a shock. Yeah, it would be. I would often think it would be shocking for his mother and possibly for my. They weren't yet married for my granny as well, because I often wondered what she'd been doing in the meantime. But they went on to get married anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought that before. I actually came across it nothing to do with your granddad, but a few. lots of personal matters in the letters home, um, which were unpublishable like that as well, that reminded me of about. Affairs and um, heartbreaking ones of women writing to brigaders saying, I've met someone else. It was just a thought. If you take a decision at that point, if you sensationalize it or not, don't you know? So that's the novel that will actually make someone. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Yeah, I, I knew a, a fellow who was a volunteer and he, he used to. Used to it was 1946, so it used to always be singing uh, the, the tango uh, tune. Some call him Pablo. They say, some say he's a dreamer. Uh, some say he's lazy, others crazy. Do you, do you think that when you come back, they felt it was all worthwhile? Uh, it's according to, uh, again, the one, the one brigade around you, Steve Fullerton, it was certainly worthwhile. Yeah, I, I didn't see, there's obviously regrets, especially about the British government not doing anything to help them and the treatment they got when they came back. They were pretty much blacklisted from work and from joining the army, even though they were experts at fighting fascism at first. Um, but I didn't detect any regret. Lots of them saw it as the first act of World War II in a positive way that they, the, the defeat, of the eventual defeat of Hitler had started in Spain, which is quite a hard thing to get your head around at first because they were defeated. But, you have to remember what optimistic people these were and what open um, people that, that saw the world in such a way that, that you could go with broom handles and beat Hitler. And there's a certain outlook about that. And, and I think even Hitler couldn't defeat that, that spirit, although there was a lot of short term, and there was bitterness through the years, of course, as well. And they were, when they were repatriated, they all got bills from the British government for, for their repatriation, which there's no record of any of them paying. No, this fell off. When he came back, he was blacklisted. He was an engineer. Couldn't get a job, so he emigrated to America, and then he was joining trade unions and so on. Become active there and get deported back to Britain again. Mm -hmm. So he <laughs> uh, had a hard life. He, he actually died in 1940. He only had ten years to live after. Mm -hmm. He lost an eye in the, in the war as well. So. Yeah, I had it hard. He got divorced because it was difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. you know, these things, there's definitely, yeah, that, I suppose I'm speaking about public reactions, but there's def definite effects on, on mm -hmm. families. And, um, I know a, a, a daughter of a brigade who said there was, there was always a, a, a second person in the marriage and it was the Spanish Civil War for the next 40 years of the marriage. It was an obsession and things. And, yeah, it's easy for an outsider like me to romanticise and things. Um, but yeah, of course, there must have been horrible effects and no counselling then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they wouldn't have been allowed it if it had been available, such as the treatment. Something I was uh, surprised about in reading uh, some years ago was um, that one of Jack Jones's pals in Spain was, in fact, Edward Heath. And Edward Heath was a supporter of the Republican and the Brigade who yeah. in fact went to Spain. Is there any other examples of people who were not on the left or were the Brigaders exclusively? I suppose a lot of the adventurers, you know, the bigger portrayal of the Spanish Civil War is about poets and aristocrats and things, and I don't suppose some of those were on the, I mean, Churchill's, um, was it Churchill's nephew was there if I think. Not huge evidence, but there would have been, there were, there were apolitical people, there were, you know, there was a small percentage of, of adventurists, no doubt you had to be a bit adventurous. And I don't think they were particular. I mean, even Steve Fullerton, his reasons were, for going were really visceral about that sheer thing of seeing kids, dead kids being held by mothers. And 
And he said to me again and again, he was so intimidated when he got to Spain and they could all quote Marx and they were all massively into politics and he was, he was always about the, the cinema and things, it, just, it was in his heart. So that's definitely it became politicised though because it's quite inevitable. <laughs> Me he cortado los espadas de la comida. Actually, his brothers fought with the, with the, yeah. with the fascists and he ended up living in London. I think he was a toilet cleaner or something. He was a professor. He ended up in London as a toilet cleaner. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, me he cortado los tatuajes. His mother was a nurse. The nurse that's fell back to him. Did he? If she hadn't bothered, who knows? Pain might have. I've heard it in the brand. Anybody else any more questions? Was there a religious debate of those who went in terms of Roman Catholic? Oh, from here? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I was often looking for that in letters, having already <laughs> lived here for a while and known about you know modern issues and things. And it just, well, again, wasn't something came across the, that sense of unity seemed to override a lot of things, but I'm sure there was. Uh, I mean, I remember writing in the book about uh, in Shettleston and the the strength of the Catholic Church did, did make for opposition locally and the church was, you know, against these people going and things. But once they got to Spain, I didn't find record of, of sectarian fighting. It might have come out in those football matches, I don't know, but it just seems to have been a lot of... Uh, a lot of things were, were were not forgotten but put to one side in the sake of that solidarity. And that's that's an ideal that I'm very was very pleased to find evidence rather than just in my heart. Whereas with the Irish who fought on Franco's side, eh, one of the slogans was like killing a commie for Christ and it was worth so many years. I'm not I'm not been the the what is but it was worth so many years plenary indulgence. Which meant you get a, if you were a blue shirt and you killed a communist in Spain, you end up in quicker. Which is a bizarre notion. <laughs> one of the soldiers was killed for me for a Fast track. Fast track. Fast track, is that what it is? <laughs> so is that like being at the front of the queue easy jet? You just go straight away? But Duffy's club is, as far as I'm aware, the only one in history. Which actually came back to Ireland with more people than they set out with. I had a parade down a corner street as he was. No, the friend was the Spanish for Legion. The old record of the incident. When a guppy's called a ride there, he says, Oh, good, you have them.
think it's generally accepted that the Spanish summer war was a week or something. Yeah. Um, then we had the Dilemma Pension, a couple of the Congo Legion. Can you give us a little bit of information on that? Oh, on what's the radio? On oh, the Condor Legion with the, the German uh, Air Force that tested a lot of its methods and bombs on Spain, that's what. What Gogeko was essentially was a testing of bombs, um, and it was able to perfect a lot of the methods that are used to flatten different bits of you know, the world. Really. And uh, it was very important for Hitler having that that playground to to use these new technologies on. And that's why it was the first war with that modern carpet bombing and those methods, and that's why these men would have been and women would have been so useful straight into the British forces and the Allied forces to, to use their intelligence that they had, but they were banned for a while, so that's... Is that how Guernica was used? Yeah, yeah, to test. Moss Creek? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You've been to Mallorca, that's the airport you land at, that's where they took off from, the bomb around Guernica. Right. Excuse me, I never knew that. I mean, the thing about Spain it throws up all those sort of things. We think of Spain as a place that, you know, we've all been to New York and you go there for your holidays and that. And even if you go to places like Alicante, if you get into the, the last stand, the last place to surrender was actually an Air Force battery at Santa Polo, just a buck above Alicante. And there's actually plaques there to the Welsh um, coal ships that come over to evacuate people. And I find it going to Spain, you know, you're walking about and you know, it's, the it's war is, is, is all around you, but you don't see it because it's all but bars and all the rest yeah, of it. And then you have this plaque and it's to a guy who brought a coal ship over for Wales to evacuate from. You know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's happening more, it's, well, generally the recognition of the war in Spain is happening more and more because, you know, obviously during the Franco era there was nothing and then there was a pact of silence to establish democracy. And in some areas like Catalonia they've got plaques, the museum, it's all over. Aragon doesn't recognise it much, even though that's where most of the fighting was done. Um, Belchite is the town that was left by Franco in 1939, exact as it was that day, and rebuilt exact next to it. So you could walk, you can walk around it. But when I've been twice, and they, it's incredible, it's haunting. You, just, you can see the walls as they were bombed, it's like when you watch news of Syria and things like that. Um, and when I, the first two times I went, there was no plaques, there was no nothing to keep it up, and it was just falling away and it wouldn't be there soon. But I think they're doing something with it now. But it's a very political history in Spain still, so a lot of the plaques that are going up are due to the work of people in this country and other foreign countries who are. But the, the, the main memorial in Spain to the brigaders is near Madrid, up a hill near a village, Morata de Tajuña, and um, it keeps every year, it gets paint splashed on it by modern fascists and it gets desecrated. And every year there's a fundraiser and we put it up again. Yeah. And all must have, there must have been a lot of, uh, there was a lot of British ships that broke, uh, broke the blockade. Yeah. And they, yeah. they were no seafarers that would be, were widely recognised. Yeah, we've talked about it before. Through the International Brigade, but there was a, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a book called The Ships that yeah. took the Brigade. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is a lot more people were actually involved that probably didn't get the recognition. Aye, uh, yeah, like the, the boys yeah, in the, the cool ships. The Welsh, the Welsh, the Welsh were, were talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, a, quite a few ships sailed for Scotland for Greenacre, mm -hmm. where, where the boat were quite prepared, and that must have put the, the crew in quite a precarious position with the ship owners. So mm -hmm. there, there's, there's not much recognition. No, 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 yes. No. I think the bizarrest fact, though, that I think I've just threw a, a, a kind of casual a hunt about the Greek Spanish Civil War fund is the Dad's Army was founded by Major Tom Whittingham, who was a major in the International Brigades, and he came back with the view of having what he having saw in Spain. He says, "What we need is a people's militia. What we need is a you know is a workers' militia to defend this country because we can't even rely on the ruling class because they're likely to go to fascism." And he was allowed to do that, I think, for about 18, 20 months. And then the ruling class realised what he was organising. And they took him out and put in bank managers and things like that to be the head instead of the international brigaders who would come back. But even today, I mean, like the books that he wrote, like Guerrilla Warfare, People's War, New Ways of War, are still textbooks for revolutionary organisations that he wrote for the Home Guard as a result of his experiences in Spain. 
which is quite bizarre when you watch Dad's Army <laughs> when you know what it's Genesis was. It's strange. And there was a lot of people like that, you know, I think we came back and weren't they allowed to join the army until 1941, you know, because having served a foreign power, you were ineligible to join the British Army. So the guys that you may think fight the fascists and weren't they allowed to go. If I remember a, an anecdote that many, many years ago, Bob Cooney told me about after the, the war and eventually when he joined up and he, joined, he was in the war of artillery and he fought an, a, a, an election after the a general election after the war for the, for the party, for the Communist Party, and the slogan was Vote for Gunnar Cooney. And he, I remember him telling me he was on guard duty outside some depot, and there was a couple of the uh, a couple of the officers were were returning, and he stepped manfully forward with his rifle and asked them to identify themselves. And one of the officers said, "Bob Cooney, you bastard! What are you doing here?" And the other officer was really, really taken aback by this familiarity of the officer with a with a common uh, gunner like, like Bob Cooney. And he said, um, he said, the, the one officer says to the other. Oh, Bob was my commanding officer in Spain. <laughs> and, you know, how, however you, you, you kind of you characterise the war, and, and I think there are certain kind of elements that have a vested interest in portraying the war in Spain as being a, a poet's war, an intellectual's war, a war where it was the intellectuals and what have you, and whatever kind of working class elements there were, didn't really know what there was an element of naivety about it, you, but... That clearly, clearly manifestly was not the case. It was not a poet's war, an intellectual's war. It was a people's war against fascism. And the movement that arose in, in support of the, the Spanish Republic in, in Britain and all over the world was actually a people's movement. And the movement, the character of the movement that eventually defeated fascism militarily in 1945, even if it wasn't completely destroyed, it was defeated militarily, was a people's movement. And just as the only country internationally that provided aid and succor to the, the, the Spanish Republic was the Soviet Union, so it was that the Soviet Union tore the guts out of the, the Nazi war machine, and which led to, to fascism, fascism military defeat in 1945. But it is important, I think, for people to remember that, that it was a people's movement against fascism, a people's war against fascism, a people's movement against fascism in Scotland, and certainly, Bob Cooney was, was very, very clear. I mean, he, 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 was, he was a fun of those fantastic anecdotes about, about the character of the anti-fascist movement in, in Aberdeen. And they had kids were involved, women were involved, and the kids would be, would be acting as messengers and what have you, and, and sort of riding all over, all over the sort of up and down Union Street on the bikes and things like that, and, and taking messages to various bits of the sort of anti-fascist pickets and so on and so forth. And that... I think is one of the, the the great kind of lessons of today is is that you know the defeat of reaction, whether it's in the form of UKIP or whether it's in the form of of the, the Tories getting rid of the, the Tories at the next election, whatever, it has to be a people's movement, and that that's what we what we need to remember is is actually it's the, the the degree of unity amongst the in the people's movement that will ensure the victory of the people's movement at the end of the day. But, you know, more than, more than being anti-fascist, we, we, we have to, to be for something. We are not just opposed to fascism. We are not just opposed to austerity. We are for a better form of society. And it seems to me that because of that, the, the men and women who went out to Spain to fight, their contribution to that people's movement against fascism, the people's war against fascism, was... Is, much, much more than of passing historical interest. They embody the, the finest, the best, most positive instincts of the British Labour movement and indeed the, the Labour movement internationally. And yes, there were poets, yes, there were intellectuals who went out to Spain and what have you, but it was a people's movement against, a people's war, and it was a people's movement back home, actually, that, that supported the Spanish Republic. And that's something, that's something I think that is, you know, Absolutely, it's just something that, that we we can take the, the greatest the greatest pride in, in in as part of our culture and part of our history. It's not part of the the culture of the ruling class. It's part of our culture, and I think we should be you know immensely proud of. That. And I have to say, on a personal note, every time I come into this building and I look up at that that wooden panel with all those the names up there, I think, wow, 
what a, fun, what a fantastic thing to be part of. And it's something you, I think you would, I mean, the expression that you used was, it, it, it was in his heart, absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's in our hearts as well, all these years later. But it is of more than passing historical interest. That's why we're sitting here discussing it. A very good point, uh, um, we'll see what history we can always um, take things out of history, we can always use it and adapt it to how we challenge those very same issues today. We've we'll touched on it a long time, you know, it's um, I mean, always it's outwardly about fascist, but certainly you know, looking at fascist elements throughout Europe, um, and of course, you know, there's um, here in the UK as well. Um, so, certainly, yeah, you know, it's a was a people's movement, um, I think, for bloody challenge, racism and fascism in our communities, in our country. Again, it's going to come for us. It's not going to be uh, governments, you know, it's going to be the people and you know, the bottom class people. Um, again, you know, the, the, it's so, so important that, that Daniel and other people have got an accurate account of what happened. And it's also made out of the TV series we wrote, um, but actually, yeah, you know, for posterity, for years. And the reason for that being is that, you know, obviously the time we um, the active volunteers die. Um, and then we can then see revisionism creeping in um, and the, you know, the story getting walked to suit certain people's own agenda. Um, so really, really pleased that you know, we've got this account here and that can be used for you know, future generations, um, as can, of course, you know, the, the multitude of music centre that was used for the Scotch of Fort Franco. And again, you know, the, the, kind of, the monuments as well, I think, play a very, very important part, or should play an important part, um, because we can't forget the, the immense sacrifice you know, that these people, members of their family, some people members of their family, um, you know, made and actually fighting fascism um, in Spain. Um, so, really, you know, they, they can't be forgotten. I don't know if we've got a plaque out there, but sure anybody walks in, um, traffic, um, the public, Plaque was mentioned in Custom House Key. Personally, I'd like to see a kind of annual event based around that. You know, um, I think the way it is now, it's maybe just kind of maybe certain celebrations or celebrations, certain commemorations um, that, that it's used. That, you know, so I'd like to see a annual, kind of biannual event, you know, with everybody getting involved in you know, the, the memory, uh, the, 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 the broken tales that it's certainly remembered. And, you know, if that was kind of done throughout the country, um, you know, it would certainly um, be much more up on our history, as you said. Um, again, I think that should be taken into schools, it should be put into history, modern studies classes, because that's part of our history, very valuable history, um, you know, and also very, very important. Um, it certainly would give people a sense of um, you know, what has been going in the past, and certainly, you know, as I said, how we can maybe kind of try and adapt that to, to future issues. Um, the anniversary next year, Fran? Or did someone hope not age it? Organise? Yeah, most well, certainly. Yeah. For, your, for your information, the International Museum of Trust do have a remote build, so yeah. the pop up. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I was actually here with the other one this year. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is something that we should try and get. It's right. so no doubt about that. Yeah. I think it's still in Scotland, actually. I think someone's got it in uh, it went, it went storage away. somewhere. I think, no, I think it's got it in Manchester. They were really asking. <laughs> we went to the museum in Manchester, I think that's where it is right now. There's two of them. Yeah. There's two. Mm -hmm. I think the, exact, the thing with memorials, as ever, is that the local council, the are not supporting that, and the government certainly won't make memorials, and that's why they're all away from cenotaphs and other things, which probably the, the men would have preferred. But um, if you think of, of yours here, it's right by the Clyde, it's nowhere you walk past much, you do, you make an effort to go, we do. And in Kakodi, it's in left on a roundabout almost way back from everything in Edinburgh, it's hidden in Princess Street Gardens, and um, not many folk know they're there. And that's, that was on purpose. And these these memorials only came about because of fundraising by people like us that we're talking about it today. And every year, for five years now since I got involved, we do a commemoration at our one. And, um, the unions have been great, they always give us a contribution for flowers and things. And <coughs> the IBMT, the Tosh Brigade Memorial Trust, AGM around it last year and, and, and I've been encouraged in the last couple of years that younger folk are really getting into it. I've done a couple of things in schools because some teachers are able to get into modern studies and other things like that. Um, 
and that's been good and it appeals to young folk because of that black and white, right and wrong, which is good especially when you're a teenager and you're trying to see the world like that yourself. Um, and so hard to find today, the highest idea of fighting and not being made to fight. So it's got a lot in it for children, to, 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 for younger people to get them involved. And that's what's encouraged me at our events is um, actually the, the, the passing of Steve Fullerton, um, the last Scottish Brigade, has, I thought, oh, this is, well, it's been handed, the history's been handed, the battle's been handed, the history and the, and the fighting crashed them or opposing crashed them. And brilliantly, a lot of younger folk have taken it on, and I don't mind if they get on board because of the romance of it, because of that high ideal. Um, because once they get interested, they find the, the reality of the brutality of war. And as well. it's, it's been encouraging the last few years and the events we've had, and young Spanish people come along as well. Um, so that's a good thing, it's not, it's not dying out by any stretch. It's just galvanised the, the, the whole. They're very important to keep that going. Yeah, keep it Yeah, I'm just going to. Say, um, following on to what Dan was saying there, I mean, if people here aren't already members of the International Brigades Memorials Trust, please jo join up. We've got a website, it's easy enough to do it. As Dan and other people have said, they have events every year, every July, they have a commemoration at the International Brigades um, Monument, which is in the South Bank in London, and they rotate the AGM. I think it might be going to be in Scotland again. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, and they help with, you know, either establishing new memorials or reviving the existing ones people had forgotten about. And I mean, so it's a great way to show your support. It's also important, I think, bearing in mind some of the points that a number of comrades have made, including the rap, about the sort of historical revisions about what. The war in Spain was about because IBMT grew out of the International Brigades Association, which was the association of the international brigaders, the volunteers, men and women themselves, and they were very keen, understandably so, that that should be their organisation, it should represent their views about why they went, what actually happened, and they were very, very protective of the legacy. Um, we heard a bit about what me or what all of them thought about land and freedom and I've certainly been at meetings, you know, thirty years ago and heard many of them become, you know, very exercised indeed about some of the um, the revisionist tactics. So another reason for people like us to get involved is to help protect the legacy from the very people. You know. And they're not all on the right, unfortunately. The, the people that I wanted to cha challenge what the Spanish Civil War was actually about and the, the lessons that we can draw from that today. So as I say, please, everybody, if you're not already a member, join up. Is it gone a different way in the Spanish schools, the education system? Franco year up to the year now. Well, I'm not sure that any are teaching it yet. I know some were going to, especially in Catalonia. Um, I'm not going on about Catalonia or anything for any reason. Um, but they have had a bit of a more open attitude to the Civil War. But I'm not sure it, I'll have to check because it certainly hasn't been, it wasn't, it would be taught a little bit, I think, now. But certainly for years and years, even after Franco, it wasn't taught. All you got was if you found well, to talk about it. And, um, you still, still divide families, now you still have families that don't speak to each other in villages and things. It's now yeah, just, no, fair, yeah. Thanks for coming. It's just recently, I'm sure you know, this become a topic um, in itself in the Scottish Advanced Higher curriculum. Which is, yeah, like I like to think we had a bit of an influence on that, because a lot that we've been going on about for a while. I'm sure a lot of it is too. It's good, it's a good thing. Okay. However, the way it's getting presented in schools is Puritans for a fresh period. Reasons for fresh period. Look at Gernica, look at Gernica, look at these fashion. There's still work to be done. <laughs> okay.
I don't want to prolong the meeting or anything, but just, uh, it occurred to me just as we, we I mean, Simon was talking about, you know, the, the fact that it's, you know, it, it was the, the, the working class uh, movement. And, you know, even today we see with, with modern media how manipulative, you know, uh, 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 capitalist media is and, you know, um, Make, making a, a railroad for, for the likes of UKIP, you know, and say, well, you know, look at, you know, the, the fact that we're in this crisis is obviously because of the immigrants, you know, and so on. So going back to, to the Spanish Civil War, I'm, I'm wondering just, you know, how did media portray it at the time in Britain? You know, did, were there report obviously, I, I, you know, the, the Daily Worker, I'm sure, was reporting, and I think they, I, I've certainly seen pictures of, like, Harry Pollitt, you know, and, and so on, you know, yeah, addressing... Yeah, nearly every day. I went through all three yeah. years of daily work as a yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, so, uh, yeah. and that was the main, that covered it every day, but as you might expect, cause most of the other papers were either neutral or vehemently pro-Franco, and, and, and <laughs> obvious candidate, but the Daily Mail reported that these brigaders were being paid an awful lot of money to go there and, and all this. So it's just what, as they are now, basically, but we know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, hostile press, I think it's fair to say, apart from the papers of the left. And, and in Scotland, as far as I've got, I haven't got a chance, but I've forgotten. It's four books ago. Um, the, the Herald was neutral, really. Uh -huh. um, Just anecdotally, again, on a, a cheer note. When George was um, a prisoner of war, which wasn't a pleasant experience, exactly as Daniel had said, and as well as being you know, tortured and threatened with death. We were also being starved, essentially, um, as well. But one, one morning, they broke up to a visit from the Gestapo, which wasn't at all unknown. They regularly came into the camp and helped you know, with the business of the day, essentially. But this day, they had brought in ca cameras because they were making a propaganda film to be shown in Germany and presumably, you know, elsewhere in Europe, as and when, to prove how, how well their prisoners were being treated um, in the camps. And part of that was that all of the prisoners were given out an orange to eat, which, you know, was like heaven, complete heaven. The funny part of the story was that they were given an orange and something else, you know, bread and butter, again, unusual. And George Drever, my granddad, who was a dialectical materialist, said immediately to his comrades, eat that orange first. And he said, no, no, we're going to have our bread and butter or whatever, or our soup, and we'll have the orange for pudding. He said, if I were you, he said, I would eat that orange first. Anyway, some of them presumably did eat it first. He certainly ate his first. And he was very glad that he did so, because they fin finished the filming very quickly in their room back around the prisoners and collected the onion oranges back in. Which is almost to be used as you talk, sir. Maybe Jane was patient, I think I'll just get uh, one more from that. I know you can come up with um, Derek Blair, you mentioned Derek Blair, George Orwell. Did George Orwell actually um, participate in the Spanish Civil War? It seems so. They mentioned in a a few letters of David Murray from the Independent Labour Party, but the thing that I always remember about him writing about, about Eric is that uh, he was, because all of went on and on about this being shot through the throat and he made whole, you know, wrote a lot about it. Uh, and in, I've got that letter, I was staggered by that letter, it was brilliant, and it says, I saw Eric uh, in Barcelona looking quite the thing walking about town, <laughs> that's after he'd been shot through the neck, which I quite like. So, yeah, he was mentioning a couple of, of letters has actually been there. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the London Freedom here or the news on that plastic license. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, possibly. If anybody's any qualifications, before we go, Daniel, I know I'll applause for this guy. Before he said before. It's your one for you, guys. Interesting. Firstly, you know. So get home not hate material for the back and if you're low on the home not hate get a Glasgow email list, we'll get a, a sheet in there, you can put your name on it, you'll get a star there and it just comes directly to yourselves and a lot of you know, useful information, local events, etc. etc. 
Ähm, ihre Umfragen haben auch immer noch zu wenig gemacht, ich habe gerade eine Liste geschrieben, auf die ich auf die von Fresh aus ähm, und Freddy Reiko vor, ähm, ist die Zeit, die Fresh auch nicht die Fresh mit Fresh mit Partnerschaft, also eine Fresh mit Branche, das ist eine Fresh mit Fresh Branche in der Ausstieg, das ist der Fresh. Ein Kommissar, der mit dem Jessmann, der ist ein Stolz drauf, der hat eine Experience in der Diskrimination, der ist ein Fest, der ist ein Fest, der ist ein Fest, der ist ein Fest, der ist ein Fest. Also, ich will nur sagen, wo ein Merkel-Punkt ist, der ist ein Fest, 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 Es kijkt, dus als mensen in de koning op plus ons op de zelfs op poten zijn, dan een haast op de jeets, de woning moet vast, die in de eigen join aan die van Joffrey met John Eek, hun die ja, dat je een organisatie is nog voor de rest eerlijk, vijf, 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 dus dat is nou weer weer wat veel van die doen. Lastly, dat je doet bij de woning staat, een hele basis, de drie series, dat je het zelf had, in ons coverage, bij de gaas tegen de animatie aan de markt, aan de fraas aan de markt, dus dit is absoluut gezegd, die nog niet. Um, just for that, coverage alone is, is very well by and by and on a regular basis. Um, as well as also a very good tool uh, to, combat, to combat the, the government propaganda and scapegoating that will come again um, with immigration. Um, so we will really consider, consider applying the modern style. Um, I think we're going to have a collection as well for the start. The bun is here. Good. So we'll just put in as much of this blood as you can afford. Um, thanks very much for attending and I thank you. Also, we can speak to our Daniel Gray. Thanks.